I have my list of 104 must-know tunes. Yeah. And these are the 104 must-know tunes, and I have them the first 52 and the second 52. Yeah. And the and these are all standards and tunes that yeah. are played at jam sessions and gigs and yeah. so forth. And so the idea, Bob, is that the first 52 are a little bit easier than the second 52. Yeah. But also, if if you're a jazz musician and you don't know, if you get called a, a, a tune called on that first list of 52, yeah, you're going to be really embarrassed. Right, right. If you don't know it. And on the yeah, second right. list of 52, you'll still be embarrassed, but not as embarrassed. <laughs> So funny. You're taking me back. I remember, I can't remember what magazine it was, Keyboard Magazine, I guess, when it was around. Uh, Dick Hyman posted, a, a had an article, 100 tunes that every jazz musician should know. And boy, I started working on those 100 tunes. And then uh, right away, and then the next month he had another article, 100 more tunes every jazz musician should know. I said, what the heck? You know, in the next month, 100 more jazz. You know, I'm like, I can't keep up. Uh, but that's fantastic. That 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 is awesome. You and, know, and the reason for the fifty-two, or the hundred and four, one tune a week I for two just, years. I was just going to say, I knew there was, I knew there was some formulaic approach to that. I and, knew and, it. And then, and by the way, once you learn those one hundred and four, Dick Hyman's next hundred and four, <laughs> Dick Hyman's next hundred and four, <laughs> so much easier because you're saying, well, this is this is just like this, except it's oh. Listen, I'll tell you a really quick story. A, a, a jazz pianist that I grew up admiring uh, uh, back in the, in the Quad Cities, his name was Warren Parrish, and he spent time in Florida as well. Great jazz player, hung out with Rich Madison, Jack Peterson, you know, that kind of player. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I asked him one, I was like 14 years old, and I asked him how he knew so many songs. And he took his little cigar out of his mouth, you know, like this. And he looked at me like I just asked him the dumbest question in the world. And he said, what? I said, Warren, I said, I, I come to gigs. I, I see you play. You take every request. Singers come up. They want to sing a tune in a, in a certain key. I never see you not be able to play a tune or play a tune in the key uh, that, that somebody wants it in. How do you do that? And he looked at me, takes another puff. He goes, Bob, what are you talking about, man? He said, they're all the same. Yeah. Now, when I was 14 years old, I thought, what's he talking about? What a kook, you know, that, you know, Misty's not the same as I left my heart in San Francisco. Those are like two different, what's he talking about, you know? Now, you know, 45 years later, JB, I, I go, oh, now I understand the depth of his understanding of music. He's he's looking at that harmonic structure and those those changes and the commonality of these progressions that he's seeing over and over again and all these tunes that he knows it so well, hears it so well, that he can actually make the statement, what are you talking about? They're all the same. Wow. I love that story and I'm and I'm with him. When I when I first when I first came down to Florida, um, and I was a guitar player then, you know, mm-hmm. before I made my transition, right. I wanted to study guitar with whoever the best was. Right. And I found out that the very best guitar teacher was named Randall Dollahan, who taught at the University of Miami. So I call, I call him up and I say I I, I want to take some lessons with you. He says, "Well, I have I have no time. I, I'm basically I'm just teaching the graduate students here at, at Miami, and I, I let me recommend one of my students." So so I said, "No, I want to study with you. I, I, right? I, I'll pay you what." And I remember I paid him a hundred dollars a lesson, which was a lot of money back then. Oh sure. And um, and I said, "Could I just take one lesson? I'll pay you a hundred And he said, "Okay, one lesson." So I go go to the lesson. And remember, this is this arrogant kid who thought he knew everything, and you know, which I subsequently realized I know nothing. But I go in there, so he's teaching me, and he can barely get a word in edgewise before I'm asking a question. What, right. But can't I use this scale? Well, what about the super low range? Well, can I use the diminished scale? Well, what? So, right. so finally, you know, at the end of the lesson, you know, like he's watching the clock because at 58 minutes, it's you know. <laughs> He said, okay, he said, uh, we're done. I said, well, could I schedule another lesson with you? And he said, yeah, you can, we can, you give me a call. I'm going to give you an assignment. And when you're finished with the assignment, you give me a call and I'll give you another lesson. And I said, okay, what's my assignment? 
and he gave me a list of a hundred tunes. He said, "I want you to, <laughs> I want you to memorize these hundred yeah. tunes." Uh huh. And I said, uh, "And I, of course, I knew none of them on there. I didn't right. know a song from my father or Blue Boss or anything." Right, right. And I said, "I said, why do I have to, why, why do I have to memorize these hundred tunes, bef before I have my next lesson?" He says, "Because then you won't have all those damn questions." There you go. And he was right. He said, the answers are in the tunes. Yeah, right. How chords work, how, yeah. how yeah. people solo, what, what makes right. a good solo. Right. How right. a melody works with a chord yeah. progression. Yeah, right, right, right. He said, the... and, and so I learned my hundred tunes, you know, ten years later. <laughs> and, did, you, um, did you call him? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm ready. So, I'm ready, man. But, but uh -oh. he was right. I learned how chords work. I worked, yeah. learned what scales work with what... Uh, yeah. Tunes. I yeah. learned what what a good what good solo development was. Yeah, you know, you mentioned something earlier. I got to go back to because it's so profound, and I I want listeners, I want to talk about it again because I want listeners to really take this to heart and start utilizing it when practicing. You said that when you start somebody improvising, you start with the roots and the thirds, and they have to do something rhythmically with those two notes to improvise. Okay, this is profound, and I want listeners to know how profound this is because we all think, everybody thinks when they start improvising, you know, they, everybody thinks of hands flying across the keys like this or up and down the guitar fretboard like this, and they don't realize that you can develop your improvisational skills and your approach to improvisation with two notes moving through a set of changes. And I had a teacher that I was, I thought that this two-note approach, I thought this two-note approach was beneath me. I thought that, how insulting. I got to be able to play more. Man, I got to be free, man. I got I to gotta have the, I got, you got to give me the, enough leash to let me roam and, and to create and be creative. And I can remember he said to me, Bob, can, can you improvise with two notes? And I said, um, no. And he said, so you think adding a third, fourth, fifth, or six, or seven notes is going to make it, like, easier? Mm. I said, yeah. He said, so stop thinking in terms of the quantity of notes that you're playing. Say something musical. Say something with the root and third. Do something rhythmically that's musical. And and you mentioned this, and this is a profound statement that I think a lot of times students, we say this, right? But I think it goes in the one ear and flies out the other ear. So can you just expound upon that just a little bit more of why that is so important? Well, yeah, beginning improvisers, they, and once they learn the scales, that's what they start doing. They start running scales and right. so forth without, right. and without right. any rhythmic content right. by... by Saying just roots and thirds, and then on the next chorus, roots, thirds, and fifths, it, make it interesting rhythmically. That gets in their mind that they have to be rhythmic. You know, I'm reading the uh, the, the biography of Sonny Rollins right now. I'm mm -hmm. halfway through. Its book is this thick. Wow. And it's brilliant, brilliantly researched and written. And this is one of the great things that made him, I mean, of course, he had all these fantastic chops and everything, but with his right. rhythmic Right. And his ability to develop solos. Right. So you start out making them aware of rhythm right from the beginning, and that's going to inform everything they else, everything f further that they do once they do have chops and can right. play double time and r run up right. and down. Right. And so I take that song from my father that that's, that solo that Horace Silver plays on that on, on that first chorus, and it's mostly chord tones, right. with just a few extra scale right. tones it's mostly right. outlining the chord i mean right but it's so genius rhythmically right. how he does it and how right. he places it and he also uses the blue scale right a little bit you know where they have the breaks there so yeah. you can use the blue scale the band breaks so it's not going to clash with anything right right <laughs> and and so this whole percussive rhythmic thing and uh and then they're getting vocabulary right they get like like when when Horace at the end of his first two uh, first two ways he goes he goes which is just a, such a great lick. Now, 
one three four five one four one three, and he he harmonizes. He he goes um. But for a single note instrument, it's just right, right. And I say you're playing you're playing on a minor chord, and you you start with that or end a phrase with that. It's like wow, this cat's checked out Horace Silva. <laughs> That's right. You know. <laughs> Yeah, not a yeah, bad person to check out. Yeah, not a bad person to check out, right? So, Clark Terry, Clark Terry said, "There's, there's nothing wrong with copying as long as you copy the right cats." That is exactly <laughs> that. It's so true, right? So true. So, um, you know, another thing that I want to uh, see if uh, get your thoughts on when I have students come to me and they want to start studying jazz. I always, JB, I always say, "So you want to study jazz?" Oh yeah, I want to study jazz. I said, well, then tell me, you must know then what jazz is the study of. So what is jazz the study of? And then there's silence. Yeah. And I said, they don't know what to say. And I go, but you, you just told me you want to study jazz, but you can't tell me what jazz is the study of? I said, this kind of is a problem. And they go, yes. And I said, so let me start this way. Let me tell you what jazz is not the study of. Let's start this way. And they go, okay. I said, jazz is not the study of dots and buttons. In other, in other words, you see a dot on a page and you push a button on a keyboard. Or you see a dot on a page and you pluck a, pluck a string. This is not the study of jazz. I said, jazz is actually the study of shapes and sounds. Shapes and sounds. So we have to know the sounds of jazz, and we have to know the shapes for those sounds. That's where we begin. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I love what you just said. I, I would like to borrow it, if I may. Oh, you absolutely. It's, it's all yours, JB. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, I have, um, it's all about listening in the beginning mm -hmm. and along the way. That's right. You can't you can't learn how to speak a language of any kind without hearing it. Right. You uh, and of course the younger you start the better. Right. Uh but to learn how to speak French strictly out of a textbook you it's never going to sound it's never going to sound right. It's always right. going to sound like well I kind of understand what he's saying but I can tell you one thing that cat's not French. <laughs> Well, listen, it's funny you say that because I always use the example. I always I say if a Texan goes over to France and he goes, parlez-vous français, mademoiselle? I, I said, the, the French are going to go like, okay, well, he said the words, but, dude, that's that's not French. That's yeah. not French, right? Yeah, you, 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 you got you to gotta know the language. And, the, and it's, it's like if you're in New York and someone comes... Yeah. Uh, someone comes up to you and says, "Hello, can can you show me where where is the tube?" <laughs> right. you, you'll know he, he means the subway, but you'll also know this cat's not from New York. <laughs> <laughs> He's not from New York, right? He's not from New York. So, and yes. vice versa, New Yorker goes, "Uh, hey, in, in London, where's the subway?" Right. They'll right. know he's not a Londoner, so yeah. So you know, it's so yeah, funny. you got to listen. And you know, I have a ten-step process, and on my website, uh, I have the the ten-step process of learning tunes. And step number one is listen to the definitive recording numerous times. Yes. Listen to the definitive recording. Know the personnel. Yeah. And then that's the step one. Then step two is you you learn the form. You listen again. You learn the form. Step three, you do the root movement. Just play the roots. Step four, you play the chords. If you're a pianist or a guitarist, you comp good voicings, you, or you learn voicings to comp. Right. If you're a, if you're a horn soloist, then you arpeggiate those chords. And I on my website, I show you how to do it, like how to do two fives right. and so right. forth. If you're a pianist and guitarist, you've got to be able to do both. It takes right. you twice as long. You've got to be able to comp. Right. And you got to be able to arpeggiate the chords too. Correct. Number five, step Correct. number five. This is all along with the definitive recording. Right. You play the scales that the chords imply. Right. Number six, you memorize the head. Notice how long, how much, how long you wait to memorize the head. You that's don't a, memorize the head first. That's that's the mistake we all make. 
And so you're not able to relate it to anything. So, so you're playing song. So you learn song for my father. You learn that the first mm -hmm. chord is F minor, and then you learn you, you go through all those steps, and finally you get to step six, and you play the melody. And you say, well, what's what scale is that? <laughs> oh, um, it's F minor. Who would have thunk? You know? <laughs> right. So you wow, what a coincidence. So, so you realize, <laughs> you realize that these melodies go with these chords. Yep. And that way you can use them later on intellectually for quoting and yeah, trans yeah. And, and transposing them in other keys and so forth. Yeah. You then step number seven is you improvise. You practice improvising with everything you know. Step number eight is that you transcribe from that definitive recording. It doesn't have to be someone's whole solo or even a whole chorus, but transcribe something. Eight bars, a two-five, a turnaround, right. something. Right. Then step number nine is so, uh, practice improvising again using your newfound material. Mm -hmm. Try not to have it sound contrived, get it inserted. And by the time you get a whole lot of material, a whole lot, a whole lot right. of material, pretty soon you're not quoting anything. It's just, right. it's just informing everything you do. Right. And then finally step ten is to make sure you know everything that's on the definitive recording that those in the know know. Like right. if there's a harmony part or a shout chorus or a definitive introduction, like on right. Take the A Train or all the right. things you are, right. or a definitive ending. Right. Make sure you know what those in the know know. And that's Correct. the 10 step process. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, uh, so, number six, right? Number six was learn the melody. Correct. Right. And <clears throat> so, this same old crusty jazz pianist that, that was one of my mentors when I was a kid. He used to say to me, if you want to get good at improvisation, if you want to get good at creating melodies, study harmony. Study harmony. Oh, and and I used to think, wow, what does that mean? Because I used to always think, okay, melody and harmony, those are two different things. And what you were just illustrating there with Song of My Father is, wow, chord scale relationship. Isn't that interesting how that melody flows out of that, out of that harmony, out of that, out, out of that chord? So that's so that's so important, and the root movement. I can't stress enough. You you mentioned that. I I stress that all the time. Uh, harmonic analysis in terms of in terms of oh that's that's a one going to a six going to a flat six going to a t that's very different than understanding chord scale relationships. That harmonic root that root movement and being able to hear that that that's a one going to six going to a flat six going to a five that kind of that kind of understanding it's it, it's absolutely essential would you not agree absolutely and, and bob you know one of the things that i do for the herbie hancock institute of jazz is that i direct the los angeles all city jazz band right and the los angeles all city jazz band is comprises the best high school kids mm -hmm. in la and because uh, la is so big um I got a nice pool to pick from. It's a oh, good, it's a do. really good band. Right. We always play at the Hollywood Bowl Jazz Festival every year. And, right. And, but anyway, I do this process with these students for every big band chart we learn. We listen to the definitive recording. We learn we learn the form. This is an eighteen piece band. We we play the roots. Wow. We play the chords. We play the scales. Then we all play the head. Every, so everybody gets a lead sheet in their key. Everybody right. gets a lead sheet in their right. key, like the Abersol lead yep. sheets. Right. And then everybody improvises on it. Now, we don't have time to have everybody play a full chorus. So, like, if we're doing, say, a tune like Song for My Father, which, which, we, which we, we might do with a beginning band, say. Right. Each student plays eight bars, and everyone keeps their place. Then I hand out a big band arrangement of the same tune in the same key. Right. And we realize what's going on. We look at the roadmap. So this is a four-bar intro, and then the, here we're at the first A, and then the second, repeat, second A, bridge, first A, second A, bridge. Right. So I'll go up to the third trombone player, and I'll say, okay, there at, at letter, H on the, uh, letter H on the chart, where are you? And he'll say, I'm at the bridge. And I'll say, and what is the chord there? I said, is a chord written there? And he'll say no. And I say, what is the chord there? And he'll say E flat seven. And I say, how do you know it's E flat seven? And they say, because I'm a jazz musician. 
And that's what we do. So that everybody in that big band wow. can solo. Now, right. different levels. You know, we right. have three or four right. kids that can really blow and right. some kids who can't. But when we, go th when we go through that, there's two drummers in the group. One's on a set of vibes, one's on the marimba, and they're at least doing the root movement. Right. At least playing the root movement with us so they understand the form That's and they understand so, the root movement. <clears throat> so important. So important. So, okay, let's talk a little bit more about that. The Herbie Hank, let's talk about what you do at the Herbie Hancock Institute. <clears throat> well, the Herbie Hancock Institute has several components. Uh, what we're probably most fa famous for <laughs> is our um, international jazz competition. And by the way, the Herbie Hancock Institute used to be the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz. Yes. And in 2019, they changed the name to the Herbie Hancock Institute to honor Herbie Hancock, who's been the chairman for the last 20 years. He's okay. also the International Goodwill Ambassador for UNESCO, with whom we sponsor and facilitate International Jazz Day. So, Which is coming up, right? April, April 30th. 30th, right. April 30th. So... We have an international competition every year held at the Kennedy Center. Different instrument every year. It's jump-started the careers of people like Joshua Redman and right. Chris Potter and right. uh, Ambrose Akumaseri and mm -hmm. Gerald Clayton. These are all mm -hmm. people that were either one or finalists. It's people you really didn't hear of until they won the competition. So right. it really helps jump-start careers. Then we have our college program here at UCLA which is a graduate program. Uh, we take between five and eight students every two years, and wow. it's a specialized program where we have the greatest visiting teaching artists come and teach here, like Herbie Hancock and Christian McBride and Dick wow. Oates and right. Billy Childs, and they, they, have a different, you know, they, they, they have a different artist with whom they uh, work with every couple of weeks. I teach them jazz pedagogy, uh, and then they take uh, they take one class per quarter, a regular UCLA music class, and at the end of two years they get a master's degree conferred right. by UCLA. Wow. So it's they, it's one it's it's one combo. Mm -hmm. I mean, we take piano, bass, drums, and then you know four, three or four of whatever else. Right. This year, this year it's an octet. It's been a quintet, sextet, and they they do all their classes together. They play together. They record together. They write. They, they do all these classes with these visiting artists. Uh, as I was saying, we facilitate International Jazz Day. And then one of the programs that I oversee is our National Performing Arts High School program. And we're in 13 performing arts high schools around the country where I visit each of these schools from L.A. to New York. And I mentor the teachers and um, I work with directly with the students. And then while I'm doing that tour, spending three days at each school, I covertly put together two quote-unquote all-star groups where we do what we call peer-to-peer -peer jazz informants tours where we take this quintet wow. or sextet of these amazing young kids who play better than a lot of the pros I play with, frankly. <laughs> wow. they're, you know, they're, they're the kids with the blinders on and, yeah, and they're right. not jaded by the real world yet. They've got these great attitudes. You know, they just want to learn and they actually think they're going to be able to make a living in this music. <laughs> Keep them in the dark as long yeah, as you yeah, can. Shh, shh. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, and and we put a major artist in front of them, and we 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 tour in different states performing in high schools. So it's kids teaching kids. Yeah, that's unbelievable. So they're telling them, hey, there's more to music than just rock and roll and hip hop. Those are great right. genres too, but you need to check out jazz. Right. But they're also teaching them how jazz represents teamwork and unity yeah. with ethnic diversity and persistence and perseverance and yeah. democracy and the yeah. vital importance of really listening to one another mm. and the correlation mm. of hard work and goal accomplishment. Right. But even more important, we, we, these are high school assemblies. They're saying, you know, we're doing something with our lives. You need to do something with yours. Oh, it doesn't have to be music, but find a right. passion for something. Yeah. Believe in yourself, work hard at it, and go for it. Yeah. Now, if I go in and say those things, right, they don't hear me. Yeah, that's but right. But these kids, it's always a beautifully ethnically diverse group. They all work together. They're all friendly. They're getting along, and they're playing great. Yeah. They go in and say, hey, 
Put the video right. game down, man. Find a yeah. passion. For you, it could <laughs> right. be engineering or computers right. or medicine or law or business. Right. But um, find a passion for something. So this year, we've been to 43 states. We've been doing these since 2005. This year, we're in Arkansas. These, these are in May, a week-long tour in, with um, Don Braden. We always put a, a guest artist in front of them for the wow, week. Man. And then Sean right. Jones for Virginia. Wow. But we've had Bobby Watson, Antonio Hart, Delphio Marcellus, Ingrid Jensen. Yeah. Uh, Herbie Hancock did one. Wow. Uh, I mean, just years ago, this just just uh, just amazing. Um, Dana Stevens. Um, boy, the list goes on and on. Some of the cats we've had do these tours. And they always tell me that it's one of the best weeks of their year. They I love bet. working with these kids. And I the bet. difference, and we always finish the, the week at the jazz club. Like the yeah. one we're doing in Virginia, we'll finish the week at Blues Alley in yeah. Washington, D.C. It's only yeah. a couple hours from where we finish our tour in Virginia. Right. And it's always packed because the Institute has great publicity and right, sure. gets the word out. And the difference between how these kids sound on Monday at the first high school to Saturday night at the club Night and day. You actually see them growing, which you don't see that kind of growth that fast with college students. Right, right. But with these, you're seeing this kid is a different player at the end of the week. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's what blows my mind today, the talent of the, the, of the, the kids, the young kids. And, of course, you know, right, look at, I mean, I tell the, the high school students here at the school, and I, I tell them, you, you got you have all these incredible tools at your fingertips that you that you JB didn't have, I didn't have growing up. I mean, the fact that they can go on to YouTube and and pull up Horace Silver or Miles Davis or Oscar Peterson and and literally sit there and watch video of performances and recordings uh, that, that they can use technology to create play along tracks and backing tracks to play with and practice with. It's just amazing to me, you know, with these resources and these young kids, the way they play today and they sound today. I, I'm not surprised that you're like, like what you said that you know, a lot of them play better than the pros that I play with. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing today. What's, what's happening. Well, I mean, just look at jazzpianoskills.com, what you do. Yeah. I mean, this wasn't around when we were kids. Right. I mean, you, you, you go to your website, and you can learn how to play piano right there at home. Right. You know, sit in, sit in front of the computer and, and, and learn. You know, it's a double-edged sword, though, Bob, because yeah. these kids, you know, I always talk about that um, 100 years ago, if you really loved violin music, and you loved it, and you wanted to uh, hear it any time you wanted. You wanted to listen to violin music any time you wanted. You'd have to buy a violin, right. study with a teacher for at least 10 years, right. so that when you wanted to hear violin music, you could do it. Now, you just, on your phone with your bows, you put it in instantaneously. Right. You, you, he you he hear, hear um, right. Hilary Hahn play right. brilliantly any time. Right. So when we were coming up, we would listen to the same record over and over and over again. We'd get into the nuance of it. And now yeah, they won't listen point. to a whole album. Yeah, great point. They just listen to a tune, and sometimes we, you know, what I'm doing is I'm swiping here. Yeah, 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 right. They, they, so That's a great so, point, JB. So, they, so there's sometimes more quantity than quality. Yeah, because we would listen to we would listen to recordings albums so frequently that we could we could sing the solos of every every instrumentalist on every tune. It's how often we'd listen to them. Yeah, and we'd li and we and the album would be a set list. We yeah. would see how that would right. go. Right. And now it's just tunes. Yeah. And so while so it's a double-edged sword while you yeah. do have yeah, this great point. easy access. Great point. Um they they and, and and so you look on you look on these students' phones, and they and and they got one or two thousand tunes on there. <laughs> you know, they would have to listen twenty four seven just to get through them once. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. yeah. And remember remember the good old days, man? We'd have the liner notes. You could actually read about like you said, you, you would read about all the musicians performing, their backgrounds. You'd you would you would read about every every tune, what was happening. I mean, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Yeah, if the record yeah, and in fact that was that was how we learned jazz history before yeah. before uh it was formalized. Yeah. You know, yep. with the great Mark Gridley books and Ted Joya books, which are great, great yep. books. Right. But, you you know, you go in and you just see all the advantages they have. And some kids are taking advantage of right. it and, and some are. But I try to instill how important that is to do that, uh, to yep. do that listening. If the record is iconic enough, if the album is iconic enough, there's a Wikipedia. Uh, yeah. Uh, a, a, Wiki, a Wikipedia entry that'll that'll give you basically what those liner notes were, who's on yeah. it, when it was yeah, right. recorded. Yeah, right. And so forth. So, um, hey, do we want to? I know you have some stuff that you want to share from your website. You want to? You want me to share the screen and and get into that a little bit? Yeah. Why not? You know, we were talking about um, how I show how a tune is put together, and. And you might want to show that one more I did. This, this is with those, um, one of the groups a couple of years ago, the Performing Arts High School, you know, all-star, peer-to-peer. We call it the peer-to-peer septet. Right. Peer-to-peer jazz septet. And we could we could look at that, and this is how I show people that don't know anything about jazz how a tune is is put together. Okay, so if, we're, we're, where is... If you is... go to videos... And then Got just it. scroll down to Jazz Pedagogy. Got it. And then scroll down to the third one. Oh, by the way, that first one is one we did with Herbie Hancock in the U.S. Department of Education. That's a great yeah, one. Yeah, I but see that. But um, just how jazz works. It's the third one down. Okay. And uh, let me get this. Let me get this queued up. Yeah, and go to about eleven minutes in, and that's where it starts. And yeah, um, since it's pretty small, if you can go ahead and make that full screen. Full screen now. Is it full screen? I think so. Yep. All right, so here we go. So now we're going to play Tenor Madness for you, but we're going to break it down into its basic elements. And I'm going to show you all those elements chorus by chorus. So the first chorus, all you're going to hear are the basic chords. Like you'll hear B-flat seventh with a B-flat in the bass. The bass player will play B-flat in the bass. And then we'll go to E-flat seventh. And the bass player, again, plays the E-flat in the bass and then back to B-flat 7 and so forth. Then the second chorus and the third chorus and the fourth chorus, I will show you what happens to make it sound, what the musicians do to make it sound more like jazz. When you finally hear the melody come in, that would actually be the first chorus you'd hear in a jazz performance. They always start off with the head. Remember, jazz is like a sandwich. you got that first piece of bread at the top. There you go. And the... And you'll have that head again at the end. That's the melody and all the good stuff in the middle. So without further ado, let's listen to the elements of Tenor Madness by the Herbie Hancock Institute National Peer-to-Peer Jazz Septet. Wow. Notice there's four beats in each measure. B flat seven. One, two, three, four, B flat seven. Two, three, four, C minor. Those are just the basic chords. Now, now notice the bass player is creating what we call a walking bass line. He's putting a note on each beat. Notice one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. He still lands on the roots like he lands on F, lands on B flat, but all the other notes are improvised. Now we take the drummer, and he'll take his right hand on that ride cymbal over here and line it right up with the beat with the bassist. Everyone's keeping their place. And here's the 11th bar and 12th bar. Now let's have the drummer add some jazz embellishments. He'll add some more embellishments rather than just playing that quarter note beat. He'll add a swing rhythm, and he'll take that left hand on the drums and his right foot on the bass drum and have a musical conversation between his left hand and right foot. 
and he's embellishing even more now. And the bass player is adding some embellishment. So rather than just the quarter notes, he's giving some a D, 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 D. And again, all that's improvised. Yeah. Now, rather than just those basic chords, let's have the pianist add some jazz chords. Notice he's got two hands on the piano now, adding more notes, sounding more like jazz. Yep. More interesting. Now, rather than just playing the chords when they change, he can add rhythmic variety by comping the piano anytime he wants. We call that comping because it comes from the word complement and accompany. Now, the horns are going to get ready to play the head now. And this is where the tune would actually start. This would be the first chord. And they're starting off right playing the music, just like Sonny Rollins wrote it, but with a nice swing feel. So this would be the first chorus, and bar 11, and top. Now they're repeating the head, but notice they're in harmony. But no harmony is written. They're doing the harmony part by ear, utilizing their knowledge of music theory. And now it's time for the solo. And we start off with tenor saxophone. We can start off with anyone we want. We start with tenor saxophone. That's Ephraim Dorsey. And he's from Baltimore. And we're at the top again. And this is Eben Dorsey playing the alto saxophone. And she's also from Baltimore. All improvised. And now it's time for the trombone solo. And that's Melvin Nimitz. He's from New Orleans. Let's see who solos next. And that's time for the guitar solo. And that's Kai Burns. He's from Los Angeles. And now time for the piano solo. And that's Josh Wong, also from Los Angeles. And now time for the bass solo. And that's Gabe Barnard from Miami. Now, after the bass solo, we're going to do a thing we call trading fours. And that's when we have a musical conversation with the drummer. The saxophone asks the drummer a four measure question. And the drummer answers. Everyone keeps their place. Alto saxophone answers the drummer. Drummer answers the alto saxophone. Can everybody keep their place? And we call it trading fours because everyone's playing four measures of soloing. And that's Lawrence Turner on the drums from Houston. Now everybody's soloed, we traded fours. Now we're playing the head again. So we know the tune is almost over. Notice the horn players are all in unison meaning playing the melody right together with each other. And they're repeating the melody, but notice this time it's harmonized, but no harmony is written. They're harmonizing it by ear, utilizing their knowledge of music theory. That's how jazz works. 
that that's uh yeah that's that's awesome man that's 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 fantastic that's such a great you just you just walked everybody through the sandwich walked everybody through the sandwich and you know i've done this so many times and, and when we played at the dakota which is a beautiful jazz club in minneapolis uh he asked me to do that. The owner um, asked me to do that because they had a foundation and they were supporting uh, yeah. local jazz musicians. Uh, that they were having a meeting, and I I did it for him. And this is the cat that owned the Dakota. And in the inside the Dakota, the piano, there's all the signatures of these cats who have played there, including Dave Brubeck and wow. I mean just wow um, Oscar Peterson and I mean just just amazing people. And this guy um, owned this club for. I don't know how many decades. And he said, you know, I've owned the club. I've heard all these great players, and I never knew how that worked. I'm going to start listening to jazz in a different way now. Wow. I thought they just kind of all played. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Now they're hearing form and composition, yeah. and it's awesome. It's tremendous. And how, how, even with these kids, how different each of those solos were. Yeah. And, so uh, so and, these are and all. How they're expressing themselves. Yeah, and these are all high school kids that we just heard here. Yeah, all high school kids. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. So um, also on the site, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of resources at your website as well as at the Herbie Hancock Institute website, a lot of resources that folks can take advantage of. Can you maybe just kind of give us a, an idea of some of those resources? Yeah, if you, go, if you share the screen, go back to... Um Go back yeah. to my website. Go to the home page. Okay, let me get there. All right, so let me get out of full screen. Okay, right. and then go to the top where it says uh, clinics. Yep. And scroll down to clinic packets. Clinic packets, okay. And... You could go to full screen now, I think. We'd be able to see them a little better. Or maybe you are on full screen. I, I am on full screen, yes. Okay, so th these are all the different topics. It, it's a little small where, where I'm looking at. But these are all different topics. Um, if you look at uh, at the bottom, you see where the one uh, next to the bottom row, 104 must-know tunes? Let's see here. Hang on a second. Let me get back to that for a second. Yes. Yeah, go ahead and double click. You see yep. that one? Go ahead and click on that one. Okay. And I'll share this tab. Yep. And can you make that any bigger? No, I cannot. That's as big as it, it gets here on this side. But, okay. But, wow. So there's the 104 tunes. Right. And if you scroll down. Okay. Yep. There's the definitive recordings. There's the definitive recordings with the personnel. Yep. And if you click on the link, it'll take you right to the YouTube. Wow. Pick a tune and see if see if it works. Yep. There's impressions, Coltrane. So talking about uh, how, how easy it is, we would have to, you know, first of all, get the $5 to buy the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is um, what a remarkable resource. Um you know, there it is, right there. Um, so, what? And, and and by the way, there are certain tunes. I, I say definitive recordings. There are certain tunes where everyone just knows what the definitive recording is. Yeah, right. right. Like for "Song for My Father," the definitive Song. recording is uh, Horace Silver. Of course. And for "Blue Bossa," it is Joe Henderson. Right. And "Bye Bye Blackbird," Miles Davis. Miles Davis. But right. what about yeah. all of me? Is it Lester Young? Is it yeah. Billie Holiday? Those are the ones that are fun to argue about. So yeah. the ones that are fun to argue about, I put the two or three that yeah, people smart. like to argue yeah. about, which is the most definitive. They're all up there as well. <laughs> right. What an incredible resource. I mean, that site, yours, between your site and the uh, Herbie Hancock Institute, holy moly, that's, that's just so much for jazz students to take advantage of. And I hope all the listeners... Uh, go over and visit and, and poke around a little bit because it's there's valuable invaluable resources so it, it, on that same page there's a, a packet called tune learning and i give the steps the uh, 10 tune learning steps i was talking about earlier and right. ex examples of how to arpeggiate right. the chords but also i have you know you were talking about 
how your friend said all the tunes are the same. What I have is a list of common occurrences. Yeah. And I put them in order. You know, I went through the book Pocket Changes. Do you, do you yeah. remember the little book Pocket Changes? That I, was I, before I, I Real Book Pro. I have them here. I have them here in my office, yeah. Book so one I and went book through, two. I went through that and, and just did a frequency count of all the things that happen all the time. And right. so what I have on there in there is in order the common the common things that happen all the time yeah like chords go around the circle of force like right, c right. goes to f and f goes to yeah. b flat that's on yeah. there you How know a flat seven seven goes to one like b flat yes. seven or f minor six which is the same chord yeah. four minor yeah. which is like basically a bach plagal minor cadence right all those are just kind of listed there with examples of where you can find them Right, five minor to one seven to four major, and you know happens, which is two five one, of course. But, yeah, right. Misty. You know, right. Exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've always said about pocket changes. I used to, I used to, um, I used to say about pocket changes. The only thing that would make this book better is if every tune was just written in Roman numerals. You know, so you'd have to actually go. Okay, let's pick a key. Let's play the tune, and and you see the harmonic function. The, I call it the harmonic DNA of the song. You have to know the harmonic DNA. And uh, how cool would that be, right? Yeah, and then you'd really see that they're all the same. Then you'd really see that, exactly. Because they're in different keys, it gives the novice the illusion that they're different. That something different's happening all the time. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. But you're so, right, man. Yeah. So Know the numbers. Know the numbers. So important. I, I uh, you know, I was a kid and I was using the John Mahegan books. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. John Mahegan books. So I was introduced to the John Mahegan books as a kid. And uh, he was big on uh, Roman numeral uh, notation. And so, you know, I learned it as a kid and it's I've been doing it ever since. So I, I in fact, so much so I can't even imagine JB not looking at a tune and understanding the root movement of that tune and what's really going on there. You know? Yeah. And and, and in, in the common occurrences that I have in the tune learning packet, yeah. it's all in numbers. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. JB, look, you have been so kind. You have been so gracious uh, to come on Jazz Piano Skills and spend time with me and for, and for the listeners. I can't even begin to adequately put into words how grateful I am and to thank you enough. It's It's been such a joy and such a blessing to have you on Jazz Piano Skills. Well, I enjoyed it, and time just flew by. I so a, in, and yeah. I, you know, and I recommend your site to so many cats. Oh, Jazzpianoskills dot com, man. It's thank uh, you. It's a must. And th by the way, this was not solicited, everybody. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is my own. This is my own. Oh. My own feeling about this. It's a great oh. site oh, and great you. stuff, and the podcasts. And you're doing great work, man, uh, oh, thank uh, teaching you, people how to play the music and appreciate the music. Well, thank you. I, I, that means a lot. Hey, listen, that means a lot coming from you. And you you just made my day. You made my week, my month, my year. So I can't I can't even begin to thank you. So, hey, listen, will you come back on, man? Will you come back on in the future to have you back on? Maybe we could pick a topic or two and really kind of drill down deeper in these some of these topics and, and deal with them. Anytime. The next time I come on, I want to talk about homonyms. Okay. Homonyms. Homonyms. Yeah. Okay. You're, stay you've tuned. Got, you spit, stay tuned, man. <laughs> All right, JB, God bless, man. Thanks so much, and uh, and uh, have a great day, and I will keep you posted. I'm going to post all your website information uh, at Jazz Panel Skills as well so people can access it and point people to your site. And then I look forward to having you back on again soon, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bob. All right, now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.